Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering, and this is module three, random variable fundamentals. So most of you, if you have an engineering undergraduate background, will have taken at least one course on probability and statistics. So probably you have been exposed to the idea of a random variable, or at least you've worked with them a little bit. However, I still find it's useful for us to go right back to fundamentals and start by talking a little bit about what a random variable is, because random variables have very special meanings, especially for engineers. Um, we're not mathematicians, we're engineers, and the fact that we need to bridge the physical world into the mathematical world means that we need to look at random variables in a certain way. So I'm going to borrow an idea from the Populus probability textbook. And in that textbook, he refers to a random variable as a function. And I think that this is a very useful way to picture a random variable. Essentially, a random variable is a function that maps the outcome of a random experiment or process to a number. Now, when I say random experiment, um, you know, I'm using the word experiment, just kind of of convenience, but I, I don't just mean that this only occurs in, you know, an experimental setting in a lab. This could be any engineering system at all that has some kind of a random output. So the outcome of a random experiment isn't always numerical. So for example, if we flip a coin, we get heads or tails. Um, but the purpose of a random variable is to take whatever the outcome of the experiment is and map it to a number. Just as, as a bit of terminology, we assume that this experiment is um, conducted many times, and each time the experiment is conducted, we refer to it as a trial. So if we think about a function as mapping something from its domain to something else in its range, the domain um, of a random variable is the outcome of the experiment, and the range is some numerical value that we um, map our number to. And each experimental result is referred to as an outcome, or corresponds to, is referred to as an outcome, um, and we say that it also corresponds to a single realization of the random variable. Okay, so let's take an example. Uh, let's consider a coin toss as our random experiment and our universal set contains the outcome head or tails so not a number um, and let's assume that we conduct the uh, experiment a number of times you know in this case I've shown four trials and the outcome that I'm representing by uh, the Roman um, letter eta would be head and then the second time we do the experiment, it's tails, and then tails, and then a head, and, and so on, right? We can do this any, any number of times. Now, my random variable, I'm going to represent by a capital letter X. And in this class, I always represent random variables as capital letters. And in this diagram, or sorry, this slide, I show the random variable as a function. And so the outcome of the random experiment is the argument to the function. And in this case, we're going to take the argument head and map it to a zero. And we're gonna take the argument tail and map it to a one. And that's all the random variable does. It maps head, tails, tails, head to zero, one, one, zero. So as we move forward in this course, I will be dropping the, the functional um, kind of notation when we when we write random variables. Rather than writing x as a function, I will simply write the random variable x as a, as a single capital letter. And we will understand that x, rather than representing uh, a constant number like a normal algebraic variable, x instead represents a random number sequence. And I, I suppose that that is Kind of how a mathematician would understand a random variable as well. It's just a variable that contains or represents many random numbers rather than you know just a, a single value. But it's super important, and I want to stress this again, for engineers to remember that each random variable essentially represents a physical process, a random physical process 
experiment that has a certain outcome that we're mapping to a number for mathematical convenience. But every time you use a random variable in your research um, or in your job, that random variable is representing something physical. So you can almost think of a random variable as a box. The, and inside the box, there's some kind of physical experiment going on. So in this case, if we open up our box that we've labeled X, we see somebody inside flipping a coin. And every time they flip the coin, depending on what comes up, they press you know, one of two buttons inside the box, and then on the outside of the box, either a zero or a one will appear. So every time we kind of give the box a poke, whatever or whoever is inside will flip the coin, um, and then we'll see a different random number potentially on, on the screen on the outside of the box. And so the random variable, the, the value of the random variable is to hide us from the physical details of the experiment, which is useful. I mean, that's the whole point of abstraction, you know, not for us to get mired in the physical details so we can work on the mathematics. But remember always that under the lid or under the hood of every random variable, there should be some physical process going on. Very important, um, particularly for, for engineers to remember that. In this course, we're going to be working with two types of random variables, discrete and continuous. Random variables that have a countable number of outcomes are referred to as discrete random variables. And so, um, you know, a, our coin toss example is a good example of that. So uh, for our coin toss, if we just think of the numerical values of the random variable now, our universal set contains um, the numbers 0 and 1, and we can assign probabilities to those, the, the outcomes um, represented by a random variable. The probability of 0 is equal to a half, and the probability of getting a 1 is also equal to a half. So um, discrete random variables have a countable number of outcomes. However, some experiments, many practical experiments, have, you know, theoretically at least, an infinite number of outcomes. So let's consider... Um, a situation where we're sampling the output of a noisy receiver with a voltmeter that has infinite precision, infinite floating point precision. So even if the range of the, um, the maximum and minimum range at the output of our receiver is, is bounded, being able to map the, you know, that noise variable to any real number within a bounded range essentially means we have an infinite number of, of outcomes. So we, we can't count them. Some random variables also are defined from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, any real number, or basically they can have the outcome of their experiment mapped to any real number on the real number line. And of course, in that case, there would be an infinite number of outcomes as well. And so in this case, you know, we can still represent our random, our continuous, and we refer to this as a continuous random variable. And so we can still represent a continuous random variable as a function. Here we're doing four trials, but now the number that we map to is some sort of floating point number. Again, if we assume we have infinite precision, then there are essentially an infinite number of, of outcomes. So we can't count them and it's not, it's no longer convenient for us to assign individual probability values to outcomes like we did up here. So we essentially need a, a different kind of tool to, to deal with continuous random variables. One useful tool for dealing with continuous random phenomenon is a histogram. And so in this slide, let's assume that we have a random waveform that varies continuously over some range. And most of you will have been exposed to a histogram before. Even students who don't take probability and statistics often see histograms when their professors are presenting the distribution of marks on, um, on an exam, for example. But just in case you're a little rusty, the, the way that you do a histogram is you essentially take a, a random quantity. In this case, it's a waveform. It could be, you know, the grades of a student that students have achieved on a midterm. And you divide the range of random values into bins. And I've indicated the bins 
using these dotted lines. And then um, the midpoint of the bins of the first bin is A1, the midpoint of the second bin is A2, and so on. And then you count the number of samples that fall into each bin. So in the first bin, we have one, two, three, four samples. In the second bin, we have one, two, three, four samples. In the third bin, we have two samples. And in the fourth bin, we only have one. So a histogram is just a plot um, of the number of samples that fall into each bin. So on the x-axis of the histogram, we show our, the midpoint of each bin. So we've got A1, A2, and A3. And on the y-axis, we just show the number of samples that fall into each bin. So we had four samples fall into the first two bins, two samples fall into the second bin, and only one sample fall into, or sorry, um, two samples fall into the third bin and only one sample fall into the, the fourth bin. So how is this useful from a probability perspective? Well, a histogram basically gives us a visual picture of which values are likely and which values are unlikely when dealing with a, a continuous random phenomenon. So we know that from looking at this histogram diagram that it's fairly likely that we're going to um, have a random waveform value in the future that is in the range of A1 or A2. You know, somewhat likely that we might see a random value in the future that is located in the range of bin A3 and possible but relatively unlikely that we're going to see something as high as the, the, as the fourth bin in, uh, in the range of A4. So we get this kind of picture of you know, the, the distribution of the waveform or, or where the waveform spends its time. Now, we're not going to use histograms exactly, but we're going to use something called probability density functions, which are, you know, you can almost think of as infinite precision uh, histograms. So the first tool that we use to deal with continuous random variables that have an infinite number of outcomes is a probability density function or PDF. And just to start off with a bit of notation, if we're dealing with a random variable x, the PDF is denoted as a function f, the subscript is a capital X, and then the argument to that function is a lowercase x. Uh, if we were dealing with uh, the PDF of a random variable y or z, um, these numbers would change accordingly. And so I think the best way to start off with is just with an example. A uniform distribution is the PDF of a random variable where the numbers between A and B are equally likely. And so we can specify the PDF either in equation form, like I've done here, or we can draw it, like I've done here. Now, it's super important to remember that PDFs are just histograms, okay? So this equation just specifies the shape of the histogram. That's all it does. So you can imagine that for this random variable x, somebody before you, so if you're given this PDF equation, you can imagine that some researcher before you basically pulled the lid off of the random variable x looked inside it to see what physical experiment was going on there and said, okay, this is a continuous experiment. And so I'm going to do this experiment basically an infinite number of times, record all the outcomes that I get, and then I'm gonna make a histogram, but I'm gonna make the bins infinitely narrow, infinitely small. So rather than getting kind of a, a column diagram or a bar diagram that you normally see with histograms, you essentially get a smooth um, shape, which is what we have here, right? We have this nice, smooth, continuous shape for our histogram. But if you want, you can think of it as being made up of those little columns, but just super, super skinny columns. But again, the equation defines the shape of the histogram. It does not, you know, define the behavior of the random variable, or it doesn't define uh, 
you know, directly define the values that you can expect from the random variable. And just looking at this uh, uniform distribution, again, visually, we can kind of see what to expect from this random variable. So we cannot, because the, the variable is random, we cannot predict what it's going to do in the future. So if we run our experiment one more time, we cannot predict exactly what's going to happen. But this PDF does give us a hint. So between the numbers A and B, we can see that all results here are equally likely. The same number of samples have fallen into the histogram bins between A and B. So all those numbers are, are equal, equally likely. We can also see that zero samples have fallen into the bins below A and zero samples have fallen into the bins above B. That means that the probability of getting a value less than A or greater than B is zero, right? So that's, that's never gonna happen. So already just from looking at this, we can gather some useful information about the random variable. We can't predict exactly what the values are gonna be, but we get a much better idea of what to expect. Another extremely important random variable for engineers is the Gaussian distributed random variable. And the Gaussian PDF has this equation. It's defined over the whole real number line from minus infinity to plus infinity. But it has this bell curve or normal shape. And it's centered at mu, which is the mean of the random variable. It's the average of all the numbers represented by the random variable. And we'll get into um, you know, means a little bit later on in the course. And so that's one parameter in the equation, basically determines the, where the, the distribution is centered. And the second parameter is the variance, which determines how spread out the distribution is about the mean. The greater the variance, the greater the spread of the distribution um, around mu. And variance is also something that we'll talk about a little bit later on when we start talking about the moments of a random variable. The reason why the Gaussian PDF is so important for engineers is because it's, it can be used to represent thermal noise. So in any um, electronic device, the random motion of electrons within the electronics um, causes variation in the voltage signals in the, those electronics. And that variation, although they're very small, if we're dealing with very weak signals, as we often are, in instrumentation or communications applications, that noise can actually cause significant distortion um, in our system. And so whenever we have thermal noise being added to a signal or present in a signal, we represent that thermal noise as a random variable and the PDF of that random variable is Gaussian. So the PDF has some very important properties. Uh, the first one, is that P, the area under a PDF is always normalized to have uh, to be equal to one. So if you integrate a PDF from minus infinity to plus infinity, it always has to be equal to one. And that's just a property. Uh, but one very useful thing that you can do with a PDF, and we do this all the time, is you can use a PDF to figure out the probability that a random variable X, and this should be a capital X, the probability that a random variable X falls within a certain range between x1 and x2. And you can do this by integrating the PDF over that range. Now, um, this is super useful and super important. And it gets around the, I guess, the problem of having an infinite number of outcomes. So if you remember back when we were talking about discrete random variables, um, anytime we're dealing with something random, we want to assign probability values. To those random things so we know how likely or unlikely they are. If we have a discrete random variable with a countable number of outcomes um, or a finite number of outcomes, we can, you know, in theory, assign probability values to each one. So when we were flipping a coin, we only had two outcomes and so we just said the probability of a zero is a half and the probability of one is a half. However, we can't assign individual probability values to the outcomes of a continuous random variable because there are too many. However, we can still calculate probability values, but we need to define a range over which we're interested. And so um, 
the probability of, of a continuous random variable following within a range is just the area of the PDF over that range. And, and hopefully this makes intuitive sense because you know if I just show a Gaussian random variable here, if we're interested in figuring out the probability that the random variable falls within this range, this is the area that we calculate with our integral. And it's a fairly large value, and we get a, a relatively large probability. That makes sense because the shaded area corresponds to a region where the histogram bins have a large number of samples in them. That's why the the you know the the value of the of the PDF is high. However, if we take the same width, a range of with, with the same width, and we just shift it over here and we calculate our area we only get that, so we get a much smaller value. Um, the small probability for the second range reflects the fact that, you know, over here, we're seeing histograms that have not had um, a particularly large number of samples fall into them, so the probability of having a value in that range is relatively small. Now, um, I use the, the Gaussian uh, PDF in my example here. Unfortunately for all engineers everywhere, there is actually no closed form solution um, for the integral of the Gaussian PDF. So that means if you're working with this on an exam and somehow you get a closed form solution for the Gaussian PDF integral, um, you've made a mistake because there isn't one. Uh, but what we do instead is we use something called a Q function and the Q function is just equal to the area um, under the tail of a Gaussian PDF that has zero mean and a variance of one. And so the Q function basically gives us the value from some point X, gives us the integral from some point X all the way up um, to infinity. So this is the value of the Q function. And we basically express, if we do have to determine the probability of you know, a Gaussian random variable being within a certain range, we can use the Q function to, um, to calculate that probability. And the Q function values, I mean, way back they used to be um, in tables and students would look them up in tables. Nowadays, um, the Q function exists in MATLAB and most, most scientific um, computing packages. So we just express our answer in terms of the Q function and then we use a computer to, uh, to give us the actual values of the, of the Q function. So um, in this course, later on, you'll be getting some practice with um, doing integrals with the, with the Q function. Because it's something, again, because the, the Gaussian PDF is so important to engineers, it's something that engineers have to do quite often. Now, of course, it's of relatively limited use if we can only use the Q function for um, variables with uh, zero mean and a variance of one. Um, but it is possible to adapt the Q function for an arbitrary mean and variance. And so um, really, you know, the integral that we would like to do is to determine the probability that X is greater than or equal to some point alpha where, you know, um, variance is non-zero and, and mean is non-zero. And we can still use the Q function for this purpose if we adapt um, this integral expression a little bit using a substitution of variables. So let's let Y equal to um, our variable of integration X minus mu over sigma, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, in that case, dy would be, just be the derivative of that expression, which would be dx over sigma. Um, continuing on, if, um, if uh, x, our lower um, bound for our integration, if x is equal to alpha, then y is equal to um, alpha minus mu over sigma. And for the upper part of our integration, if x is equal to infinity, then y is equal to infinity minus mu over sigma, which of course is just equal to infinity. So if we perform this variable substitution, um, we get this expression here, 
which you'll note is exactly equal to the expression for the Q function that we had in the previous slide. Uh, mean and variance has disappeared. The only thing is that we have this modified lower um, start point for our, in for our integral. And so the Q function then takes a modified argument, alpha minus mu over sigma. So again, if we want to integrate, you know, we've got some Gaussian distribution, arbitrary mean, um, you know, some variance not equal to one, and we want to integrate from alpha to infinity, that value is equal to alpha minus mu over sigma. So we justified the need for a probability density function using a con using continuous random variables kind of as our argument, right? We said that, you know, there's so many possible outcomes for a continuous random variable that we can't assign individual probability values to each outcome. So we need to use this, this PDF as an alternative. Um, and so that suggests that, you know, we don't really need to use PDFs for discrete random variables, but in fact, that's not true. We do actually um, define PDFs for, for discrete random variables, but we have to do it in a, in a slightly special way. And so let's start with a little bit of a, a paradox, maybe. Let's say we've got a continuous random variable X, um, and we wanna figure out the probability that it's equal to exactly X naught. And so, the PDF, uh, if, we, if we use our PDF, um, we would perform our integral from x naught to x naught, right? Because we're interested in just a single value. However, this is a, a zero width integral, which by definition has to be equal to zero. So the probability that our continuous random variable is equal to a, a particular constant value, any value at all, is equal to zero, which seems a little bit strange, but the, the way that you can best understand it is um, by assuming that you know there's just so many um, possible outcomes you know theoretically an infinite number of outcomes so the probability of getting just one particular outcome has to be equal to zero okay so obviously this is a problem for discrete random variables so for example our um, our coin toss random variable can only take on two um, values, right? You know, a head or a tail or a zero or a one. And, um, you know, the probability of getting a, a head or a tail is, is equal to a half, right? So we've got a non-zero probability. The way that we handle this is by using delta functions. So a Dirac delta function is a special mathematical function that has infinite height, zero width, but has a unit area, an area equal to one. And so this is exactly fits the bill because we can integrate, you know, over a zero width um, interval and get a non-zero value or a non-zero probability. And so a, you know, to write it in a, in a general way, a, a discrete random variable is made up of a summation of shifted delta functions each delta function is centered at um, one of the possible outcomes of the discrete random variable. And the area of the delta function is weighted by the probability that that particular outcome occurs. And so for our, um, our coin toss random variable, this is what the PDF would look like. We have two delta functions. The first one centered at zero, the second one centered at one. And these delta functions, of course, have infinite height, um, but I write numbers beside them and I'm not indicating that their height is equal to 0.5. This is indicating that their weight or their area is equal to 0.5, but understand that um, they have infinite height, right? Because that's, that's the definition of a delta function. And so if we use delta functions, then our integration works. And so, um, for example, if we wanted to figure out the probability that our coin toss random variable is equal to one, this is the way we would write the integral. We would integrate from one minus a very small value to one plus a very small value. We integrate our PDF and we take the limit. 
as that very small value approaches zero and our result would be equal to one half. Again, one half because we've weighted or scaled the area of um, the delta function to be equal to a half rather than one. Um, and so in this class, we're gonna be using, um, whenever we've got PDFs for discrete random variables, we're gonna be using the PDFs that are based on delta functions. However, um, in you know, as you read through textbooks and papers, you will also see um, what are known as probability mass functions. Um, these are also intended to represent um, discrete random variables. These are not defined using Dirac delta functions. Instead, they're defined kind of in a similar way that we draw um, a discrete time signal that's been sampled. If, you, if you're studying discrete time signal processing, we have a, a stem plot you know, that might look something like this, where we've got a value at zero and one. Um, the heights then of these, um, let's say a half and a half, the heights of these, um, these stem plots actually are finite and they are equal to the, the probability value. And there's just nothing defined in between here and in, in, in the same way that there's nothing defined between samples of a, of a discrete time signal. So again, we're not gonna be using probability mass functions in this class, but I just wanted you, uh, wanted you to be aware of them. So an, a second tool that we have in addition to PDFs are CDFs or cumulative distribution functions. Um, these are also known as probability distribution functions, but we'll be calling them CDFs in this class. And CDFs are, is by far the most common um, term. A CDF actually directly yields a probability value, so there's no, no need to integrate them. So the value of a CDF for a particular random variable is written like this. So I use the same notation that I do for a PDF, except it's a capital F rather than a lowercase f. And the value of the CDF is directly equal to the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to the argument that we're giving to the CDF. So because this is a probability value, that means the y-axis of a CDF is always between zero and one. And the um, CDF is also a non-decreasing function. That means it always either has to be constant or get bigger. And so um, as an example, this is the, the CDF for our coin tossing random variable. You can write it as an equation um, but it's a little bit easier to follow if we um, if we if we draw the picture. So the coin or the CDF for the coin toss random variable looks like a staircase, and as I said, it dr yields a, a a probability value directly. So let's say if we look at the CDF here, maybe at you know minus two. What's the probability that our random variable x is less than or equal to minus two? Well, it's zero, right? Our, our random variable can only be zero or one, and so it can never be less than, than minus two. It can never be less than minus one. It can never be left, less than minus 0.2. However, right at zero, we jump up, right? Because it's the probability that x is less than or equal to um, a particular value. So the probability, that our random variables is less than or equal to zero is equal to a half because there's a 50% chance we're equal to zero. After that, the CDF remains constant again. So what's the probability that you know, we're less than or equal to 0.5? Well, it's a half because only one of the two values the, C the random variable can assume um, is less than 0.5. Then by the same token, once we get to one, we take another jump. And after that, our CDF is equal to one. So what's the probability that our random variable X is less than or equal to, let's say um, 1.7? That probability is equal to one because both zero and one, the only two values that the random variable can assume um, are both less than 1.7 or 10 or 20 or 100. So the CDF remains at one um, all the way up to, to uh, infinity. A second example is um, for the, the uniformly distributed random variable. 
Uh, let's say we've got a random variable that's uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, which means any number between 0 and 1 is equally likely. The CDF is given by this equation, but again, it's a little bit easier to understand if we look at, uh, look at the picture. So what's the probability that the random variable is negative? It's equal to 0, right? Because the number has to be between 0 and 1. Uh, but once we hit 0, we see that we t start to increase with a linear slope. And so what's the probability that our random variable is less than or equal to 0.5? it's 0.5, right? Because half of our numbers are below 0.5. What's the probability that we're less than or equal to um, 0.9? It's 0.9 because 90% of our numbers um, uniformly distributed between 0 and 1 are below 0.9. What's the probability that we're less than or equal to 1? That value is equal to 1. And after that, the CDF remains constant at 1. So what are the properties of the CDF? Um, as you can tell from our examples by now, the CDF at infinity has to be equal to 1 because the probability that any random variable is less than or equal to infinity has to be 1. Um, the value of the CDF at minus infinity is 0 because the any random variable can't be less than or equal to minus infinity. Uh, the function is non-decreasing. We talked about that. And you can still um, use the CDF to determine the probability that a random variable lies in an interval. So um, for any x2 greater than x1, the probability that our random variable x, and that should be a capital, is um, less than or equal to x2 and greater than x1 is just the CDF value at x2 minus the CDF value at x1. And as many of you have probably guessed, the PDF and the CDF are related. In fact, the PDF is just the derivative of the CDF, and the CDF can be calculated by integrating the PDF. And if you look back at the, um, at the, the two examples that we did for the coin toss random variable and the uniformly distributed random variable, um, this should be obvious. You should be able to calculate um, one from the other.